Hey, good morning, Brookside. Pastor Eric here. And I'm so grateful that I get to do church with you online today. And I know that this crisis is just gonna keep on going. We don't know how long, but we want you to know that we still stand ready to serve you and love you and lead you as much as we're able to do. And so while everything else around us seems to be unaccessible and unavailable and shutting down, uh, we want you to know that Brookside still stands ready to serve you as a constant in your life. And so we want that to uh, be very well understood by all of you who are watching watching today. And by the way, if you are new with us, thank you so much for being with us. We want you to know that we love you so much. Even though we might not know you very well, welcome to Brookside Online. We are, online. We are so glad that you are with us today. Got a few things for you right now. First of all, uh, we want you to know that um, we have a number of platforms uh, that, you, that we can um, um, uh, serve you with. The first is our our app. And if you go to wherever you download your apps, uh, you can get Brookside Church app. And there you can find everything that's going on here. You can find all the updated messages, devotionals, those kinds of things. Um, you can connect with people and we want that to serve you. Also, we have a presence on Facebook and YouTube and also on Instagram. And so we're going to ask that on Facebook, you like us. And by the way, that's where you can watch a, a number of our Worship Wednesday experiences that I'll talk about in just a second. Uh, but if you could also subscribe to us on YouTube, that way you can keep up to date with all of the messages as well as all of the daily devotionals that we're putting out from the staff. Furthermore, let us know what's going on in your life on Instagram. Follow us and we'll follow you. Uh, and then let us know what's going on so we can keep that community strong. I want to remind you again that Worship Wednesdays is coming uh, and we started them this last Wednesday. It was an incredible experience. So many of you uh, jumped online to be a part of that. That's going to happen again this Wednesday at noon. And so get your family together, get in front of the computer, the TV, be a part of Worship Wednesdays, and we would love that you would be able to do that. Also, just again, as a reminder, we have these devotionals that are out for you. It's only five or six minute devotionals from the staff and some other leaders at the church uh, that are just there to come alongside you every day and offer you encouragement, uh, some inspiration to help us get through this uh, crisis, if you will. I do want to take a moment and share a very, very deep thank you uh, to all of you who have just continued to give so generously to Brookside. Without your generosity, we could not continue to do ministry. I know there are so many churches out there that are struggling right now because their giving, their offerings have like been cut in half. And we don't want to go there. And we believe we're not going to go there, one, because our God is so good to us. He has blessed us so much. And secondly, uh, because I know you love your church, you love the vision, and you want to see the ministry of this place continue. And so thank you so much for continuing to give generously online at brookside.org. But also, if that's not for you, we want you to know that you could still mail in your gift to Brookside. Thank you so much, though, to every one of you who have given generously to Brookside. We could not continue to do ministry without you. Uh, we're going to do some worship right now. So thanks for being with us. Prepare your hearts right now. And to do that, let me pray as we get ready to worship our God. Heavenly Father, thank you for the chance we have to come together as a church. And even though we're not in person, uh, we are together. And your church is still thriving. It's just on another platform, a different platform, at least for the time being. And I pray that you will be with everybody watching this message, uh, that uh, somehow your Holy Spirit will reach into each one of us and draw us to you. And we're so grateful that we get to celebrate you today and be together. And to that end, uh, I pray that you will be high and lifted up today on what we do. May you be praised and may your kingdom grow because of this. And we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. I want to read to you from Psalm 62 today. It says, for God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is in him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I will not be shaken. God is a refuge for us. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I proved him more and more, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Yes. 
rest is sweet to trust in Jesus just from sin and self to cease just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace Jesus Jesus how Trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I've proved him more and more Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus Oh, for grace to trust him more tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I when brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken oh I won't be shaken cause my feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. Captive to the lies. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. Oh, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in. Stand a chance when I stand in your love. Oh, my fear, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in. Off every chain, this power that can empty out a grave, this resurrection power that can save, this power in your name, power in your name, this power that can break off every chain. Stand a chance and I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance and I stand in your love. Oh, my fear, cause my fear doesn't stand a chance and I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance and I stand in.
didn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love. Hey, Brookside, Pastor Eric back with part three of our message series titled Seize the Day. And I think that's an appropriate sermon series title, don't you think? Because the church has never seen a day like this day, uh, at least in our lifetimes, right? Uh, But instead of throwing our hands up and quitting and saying, I don't know what to do, we're gonna keep pushing forward because we serve a God that says, I am with you always to the very end of the age. And we serve a God that says, make the most of every opportunity. So the question we're asking right now is, how do we as the church in this kind of a crisis continue to seize the day that God has given us right now? And so we're asking some really good questions, right? We're saying, how do we make sure that this fear of the virus does not overwhelm our faith in a sovereign God? How do we make sure that this crisis doesn't derail us from our focus? And the bigger question is this, how do we make sure we continue pursuing our mission and vision when everything around us tells us not to? Instead, the world just says, now's the time to survive. And I don't like that because the church is never meant to survive. The church is always meant to thrive. And that's why, that's why we got some good news this morning. Number one, nothing has ever been able to kill the church. Uh, the, even the greatest opposition couldn't come close to shutting us down. The church has always thrived. And, and here's the other good news. Here's the other good news. Uh, we've been studying a guy by the name of Nehemiah, right? And this guy named Nehemiah, he finds himself in a very similar situation that we are in right now. But his situation, his crisis is not fighting a virus. His crisis is trying to rebuild an entire city, the city of Jerusalem, especially because the outer walls are broken down. And when he hears about this, uh, man, it, it breaks his heart because the 50,000 fellow Israelites that are back in Jerusalem, uh, he knows that they are hopeless, they're helpless, they have no future and no potential. And so the Bible says that he sits down and he cries and he weeps over them for quite some time. And this is a new kind of day for Nehemiah, just like today is a new kind of day for us. And so for both him and us, we are called to seize the day and we're gonna push forward and continue uh, pursuing our vision uh, to that extent. But nothing has killed the church. And we're not gonna let it kill the church because the church thrives in crisis. This is not a time to survive, it's a time to thrive. And this message series is meant to talk about how can we continue to do that. But before we jump into it, I just wanna say thank you for being online with us because with the news changing almost daily, um, there's more and more things about our lives that we're used to that are just no longer available and accessible to us. And so some of the constants in our lives are just falling away right now. And it's kind of throwing our world into into, into chaos right now. But I want you to know that your church, Brookside Church, wants to be a constant in your life. What that means is we're going to continue to try to serve you and we stand ready to lead you and love you as much as we can. But what it does mean is we have to continue adjusting the way we do our ministry. So here's the request. Could you please flex with us so that we could continue to serve you, but also continue to pursue the mission God's given us? Uh, Because here's the thing. Even though we cannot wait, we cannot wait for this crisis to be over, uh, our eyes are wide open for how God is moving in this time of day. Our eyes are wide open for what God is trying to do. And at Brookside, our intention is to stay in step with him because when we're in step with him, we move with him and we experience the awesome things he's trying to do right now in the midst of this kind of crisis. And that's why I love the story of Nehemiah. Because Nehemiah had a pretty good life. I mean, he was the cupbearer to the king, right? The most powerful guy on the planet, the king of Persia that used to be the the nation of Babylon that took over Jerusalem. He's the cupbearer to the king. And granted, he might not be the five-star general or anything. He might not be the most powerful guy, but he stands in the presence of the most powerful guy. And his life was pretty good. And the rest of his fellow Israelites, their life was pretty good in in Persia. Granted, they're captives in a foreign land, but there's stability, there's constants. Uh, But then all of a sudden he hears this news that his homeland, Jerusalem, and the walls have been torn down and it throws a curveball to him. Throws a curveball to him and it throws his world out of whack, just like we've been throwing a curveball. I mean, I know our lives might not have been living in the lap of luxury and we all had some issues from family, financial, career issues. I know all that. But at least there's some constants. There's some stability. I mean, Taco Bell was always open. Chick-fil-A was always open, except on Sunday. The hospitals were always there with enough people and time and resources and beds to serve all of our needs. 
This grocery stores, their shelves were always full. I mean, it was business as usual, wasn't it? And I know business as usual can be boring, but business as usual is stability. It's security, it's regularity. Because when it's business as usual, you still have a job. When a crisis shows up like this, you lose your job. When it's business as usual, you can pay all your bills. When there's a crisis, you don't have any money to pay your bills. When it's business as usual, your family's healthy. When there's a crisis that shows up like this one, everybody gets sick and it throws us a curveball. And we are left kind of reeling from the fact that our whole world is now out of sync. And just like a ship, we're just trying to figure out how to keep our life afloat. And this is Nehemiah's story. When he hears that the city of Jerusalem and the wall is just in rubble and the 50,000 fellow Jews are there hopeless, helpless, with no future, no potential, here's what Nehemiah did. The first thing he did is he sat down and cried, right? He embraced the pain of the crisis, but he didn't stay there. He turned his cries into a prayer. And during the prayer, this is so cool. God gave Nehemiah a vision in the crisis and he let that build in him. It became a divine burden that, that birthed a holy discontent. And Nehemiah said, something has to be done about this. In fact, I'm gonna do something about this. And so he takes the vision to the king. Remember, he stands in the presence of the king every day. He takes the vision to the king. The king buys into it. And then the king says, hey man, what do you need? And then Nehemiah sets himself up for success. He gets from the king all the resources he needs to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the wall. And what's even cooler is when he gets there, he rallies all of the Jews together. And then he says, we're gonna build the wall. And he brings more and more people into his vision. What's so cool is when he first sold the vision to the king, he said, I'm gonna go rebuild the wall. But now when he's in Jerusalem, he says, we're gonna rebuild the wall. And man, by this time in the story, man, the adrenaline is up. We're excited for them. I mean, we're on the edge of our seats, right? I mean, if Disney could put music to this, the orchestra is loud and full and this whole mentality of everybody involved is like, yes, let's do this thing. So in chapter three, everybody's involved and they're all rebuilding the wall and things are going smoothly, right? And then chapter four, verse one hits. Chapter four, verse one, two guys show up named Sanballat and Tobiah. They're not a big fan of what Nehemiah is doing. Let me show you their reaction. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Now, let me tell you a little bit about why Sanballat is so mad at them because he's, he's a Samaritan, right? And prior to all this happening, the Samaritan and Jews became super enemies. They used to have a similar ancestry, but at some point, the Samaritans began to adopt other pagan religious ideas and married them with their Jewish roots. So now they're like a, a mix and mash of weird religious traditions and theologies, and the Jews can't stand this. So they become bitter enemies. And then when this Samaritan, Samuel, sees that the Jews are rebuilding their wall, he can't stand this. So he says, what are you Jews doing? By the word, when he calls them feeble, it's the very same word that's used to describe a flower that's been cut off. In other words, it's completely dead. He's saying, you Jews, you're dead. What are you doing trying to revitalize yourselves? But that's not the only person that talks. Listen to this. Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, here's the second guy, who was at his side said, what they are building, even a fox climbing upon it would break down their wall of stones. I mean, my goodness, talk about resistance, talk about opposition, talk about pushback. And this is, I think, where we really need to understand something. When you and I begin to act on the vision God has given us, uh, we can expect pushback. One of the things I said last week is that as a follower of Jesus, especially, God has a vision for you that is a continuation of what Jesus is already doing in life, in this world. What is Jesus doing? He, the Bible says he came to seek and save the lost. The vision God gives you should be, should be a part of that. He came to give life to those who are dead. He came to give hope to those who are hopeless. He came to give uh, healing to those who are broken. Um, he came to restore those to God. And the vision God gives us should be a part of what Jesus is already doing. And, and the question I asked last week is that if, 
If you don't know the vision, maybe it's because you haven't taken the time to sit down in the pain of the crisis to embrace it and then hear what God has to say to you. But this week I've got another thought. Maybe the reason some of us don't have a vision is not because God doesn't want to give us one, but because we're not willing to push through all of the pushback that we're giving when we begin to act on our vision. And I think we need to understand when we act on our vision, there's going to be pushback. For example, let me give you some examples. Some of you say, you know what? Me and my family, we really need to get our family back to Jesus. And one way to do that is by connecting into the life of a local church where we can find that encouragement and that friendship and the support and the accountability and the teaching. That'd be really important. Oh, but yeah, Sunday, listen, it is really hard for us to get up in the morning. Uh, we got lots of duty here. We got laundry, got a yard to mow. We got bills to pay. Maybe it's not a good time for us to go back to church. You see the pushback. Somebody say, you know what, I've, I've got a, a purpose that I believe God has called me to, but you know what, I need to go to school, get a degree so I can have the skills necessary to accomplish that purpose and that, that vision. But you know, that's going to cost a lot of money. That's going to be really hard, take a lot of time. I just don't know if I have the time or the money to afford that right now. Do you see the pushback? Some of you are like, you know what, I know my neighbor down the street really needs Jesus. And man, I've got the words of life to give them. But you know what? That's gonna require I spend time with them. And man, do they have a sewer of a mouth, man. And their jokes, they're nasty bathroom crude, disgusting jokes. I don't wanna be around that. So I'm just gonna kind of push that away. You see the pushback? And here's, you know, here's the frustrating thing for me. And that is because of pushback, some of us will no longer pursue our vision. Because of pushback, some of us will no longer pursue our vision. And it begins with this thought, doesn't it? It says, when you act on your vision, expect pushback. But here's the next thought. Because of the pushback, some of us won't pursue our vision. And when we do this, watch what happens. Our life kind of settles into a cruise control kind of life. I mean, we go to work, we do our job, we get our paycheck, we go home, we eat dinner, we watch some TV, and the next day we do it all over again. And before long, all we feel like is a mouse on the wheel. I mean, we're working hard, right? And things are moving, but we're not going anywhere. And before long, we look at our life, we say, you know what? Especially as a father of Jesus, what have I done to pursue what God has called me to do? What have I done to expand the kingdom of God? What have I done to be a part of what God is doing in this world? And so here, let me just ask you a couple of questions. Um, on this very day, have you taken a step toward the vision, purpose, meaning, direction that God has given your life? You might be able to say, you know, I, in this season right now, I haven't taken a step forward. It feels like actually like I've taken two steps back, but I know my direction. I know the vision God has given me. I've got a purpose and meaning. I'm crystal clear on what that is and everything else in my life is contributing to that reality. And if that's you, man, keep rolling. Sometimes with the push forward, we got to take some hits and take steps back. But we know where we're going, right? Some of us, though, we're like, step forward, step back. What are you talking about, man? I have no idea what God wants me to do. I have no idea what vision for my life actually is. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where I'm going. I'm just surviving. But guys, listen, if we're followers of Jesus, we were never meant to survive. We were always meant to thrive. We always meant to thrive. Nehemiah was never okay with just surviving. What he wanted to do is thrive. And so when he hears this opposition, when he hears this pushback from this Sanballat and Tobiah, you know what he doesn't do? He doesn't respond to him right away. He doesn't get mad. Instead, he prays. Watch what he does. Hear us, O oh our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from their sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. When I read that prayer, you know what I'm like? Oh my goodness, that is a gutsy prayer. This dude is serious and I like it. I wish I could pray more prayers like this, but here's the thing. You look at that prayer and you're like, wow, that was mean. Does he really pray that much revenge on his enemies? And I know on the surface it looks like, but here, listen to what I learned about this prayer this week. Number one, number one, uh, this prayer is not a prayer of revenge. It's a prayer of resolve. The other thing I learned about this prayer, check this out. 
This is not a prayer to get pity. It's a prayer to stay on purpose. See, here's the thing. Whenever we see pushback, whenever we get opposition from the vision that we're acting on, that God has given us, our tendency, watch this, is to slow down. Our tendency is to become more reserved, especially if you're like me, who's kind of a peacemaker at heart. I mean, I hate like conflict between people. I'm not very good with like that awkward, weird tension between people. And I'd rather be friends with everybody, right? But here's the thing. When you experience the pushback and then you go in prayer, watch what God does. He changes your mind from revenge. I want to get revenge to this. I'm just going to stay resolved to the purpose. And whatever frustrations we have, he turns that pity into reminding us what our purpose actually is. And so it's a prayer of resolve and it's a prayer of purpose. And I love this. I love this because if it was me in Nehemiah's shoes, I don't know if I would respond the same way because I want to be at peace with everybody, don't you? And so I might be tempted to walk up to this sand ballot in Tobiah and be like, hey guys, listen, man, I, I'm so sorry we made you upset. Um, I mean, I don't want to be enemies. Uh, I don't want you to be mad at me. Can, can we just kind of get along? And by the way, I got a lot of people back here telling me, listen, don't make them mad or they just won't like you. And listen, I want you to like us. And by the way, they said, if, if you don't like us, you might attack us and we don't want you to attack us at all. So is, listen, is there a way that we can maybe negotiate so that maybe we don't build all of the wall, just a little bit of it, so that you still like us. And you know, here's the thing, Nehemiah would have never said that because Nehemiah didn't walk a thousand miles from Babylon to Jerusalem to make friends. He didn't go to Jerusalem so that people would like him. He didn't go there to negotiate. He didn't go there, here's the word, to compromise. No, no, he went to Jerusalem with the permission of the king, with all the resources he needed to build a wall. That's it. He didn't go there to be courteous or polite or kind or politically correct. He came there to build a wall. And I love this about Nehemiah because in the church, we are amazing at courtesy. We are geniuses at political correctness. We are amazing and awesome at being polite and friendly and kind to everybody and the highest value in the church right now. Watch this. It's courtesy and making sure the people who complain against us and criticize us are well heard and listened to. And as long as we adjust according to their criticism, that's the big win in the church. And I hate that. Why? Because almost all of the time in order to be courtesy, courteous, and listen to criticism, it's almost always at the expense of vision. Why? Do you understand what we are doing when we do this? We are allowing the opinion of other people to be louder than the voice of God in our life. God called us to vision. Why in the world are we giving anybody the authority to derail our vision? Nehemiah would never be okay with this because he was dead focused on vision because vision trumped everything else. By the way, it did for Jesus too. We, get, we tend to get the impression that Jesus was just nice to everybody. That he was always polite and kind and politically correct. And oh my goodness, not even close, man. Just read the gospels, you'll see. For example, one time in Matthew 16, He's having a conversation with the disciples and one of the guys there is named Peter, right? It's probably his best friend. Um, and he starts to tell his disciples that in just a little bit of time, he's gonna go to Jerusalem. He's gonna get arrested. They're gonna kill him on the cross. But three days later, he's gonna rise again. Peter responds, this is in Matthew 16. Peter responds and says this, no way, Lord, not a chance, never. You know how Jesus responds? You know, if, if, if Jesus were more like me, he probably would have sat down with Peter and said, you know what, Peter, that's a really interesting perspective. Let's talk about that some. Let's find a way to compromise a little bit, negotiate, and see if there's a way that I can save the world without going to the cross. Let's see if that's possible. Why? Oh, because Peter, you're my friend and I don't want to hurt your feelings. You know what Jesus says? Watch this. Get behind me, Satan. What? This is his best friend that he just called Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Are you 
kidding me? Jesus just called his best friend Satan and said, no, no, you're getting in the way of my vision. Listen, Peter, I know that you're best friends with Jesus and I know Jesus loves you because he's gonna die on the cross for you in just a little bit, even though you betray him three times. That happens later on in the gospels. But Peter, don't get in the way of Jesus' vision. Never. Here's what I'm learning from Nehemiah and from Jesus. You ready? Here it is. Compromise always kills vision. Compromise always kills vision. Here's what else I'm learning. Vision is greater than everything else. Vision is greater than courtesy. Vision is greater than comfort. It's greater than cost. It's greater than status quo. It's greater than security. It's greater than friendship. It's greater than friendship. And so if the highest compliment people can give us is man, that church, they're just so friendly. They're just so kind. I mean, I love that. I mean, we ought to be, we don't want to be jerks to anybody, right? But if we're losing our vision for the sake of courtesy, for the sake of friendship, for the sake of security, for the sake of cost, Man, I think we're missing it because Nehemiah and Jesus never did. Never did. So I think, I think here's what happens. When, when Nehemiah understands this, uh, he prays. God gives him resolve and reminds him of his purpose. And then look what happens. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height for the people worked with all their heart. Nehemiah's like, listen, I don't care what you say, Sambal and Tobiah. I don't care what you threaten us with, with your whole army and stuff. I came here to build a wall and that's what I'm gonna do. And here, if, if you find yourself in Nehemiah's shoes, you know the vision God has given you, right? And it's awesome, you love it, but you're experiencing that pushback. Let me just give you a brief encouragement that can kind of help you out. Here it is. Pause to pray and then get back to work. Pause to pray and get back to work. And I think when you do this, you receive the encouragement, you will receive the hope, you will receive the resolve, you will receive the reminder of what your vision is. And by the way, you will be reminded, you will remember the God who gave you the vision in the first place. Uh, because when he speaks to you, there is no other voice ever or anywhere that can overrule the voice of God. So what's he asking you to do? But you know, here, here's what I've discovered about myself. Granted, I might receive some pushback from outside of myself, but honestly, the greatest pushback I experience is from myself. Let me show you how this happens to Nehemiah. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we will kill them and put an end to the work. I mean, my goodness, that ought to bring some discouragement. That ought to bring some despair. That might even bring some uh, depression, disappointment. I mean, if I hear that, I'm like, well, wait a minute. Maybe we should stop. Listen to what else it says. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us 10 times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. So I don't know about you, but if I'm Nehemiah, all of a sudden my insecurities are building inside of me and screaming at me, stop the work, stop the work, hold off on the vision. Uh, and, and this is very much true. It's very much true. Uh, because, because if you're anything like me, there are insecurities that can grow inside of you. I mean, for example, I mean, who am I really to lead a church when there's that kind of a leader out there? I mean, put it, Andy Stanley, Bill Hybels. I mean, name it, Chuck Swindoll, Craig Groeschel. I mean, who am I to lead when those kind of leaders are out there? Who am I to preach when there's communicators out there that can make, they can knock it out of the park every single weekend? I mean, they're just so naturally gifted. And by the way, who am I in the world to lead a staff when there are leaders out there with a personality that just draws people to themselves? I mean, then the insecurities begin to grow. I mean, maybe for you, it's, I mean, who, who am I to be a teacher? I mean, my own kids don't like me sometimes. Why in the world do I think that those kids, a whole classroom of them are gonna like me? 
I mean, who am I to try to rally a neighborhood together to serve the elderly in our community and in our neighborhood because of this virus? I mean, who am I? I mean, I haven't been able to organize anything before. And so the insecurities begin to rise. I mean, really, who am I to, to start a community life group? I mean, I feel like God has given me this vision to lead a group of young marrieds and young families because I see the desperate need for encouragement in their lives at this stage of their life. But what if I start saying, you know, man, you're way past that stage of life. You can't relate to them. What do you say? You know what? I, I want to I wanna go to school again because I've got a vision that God has given me. I need the skills to make it happen. And you're saying, you know what? I, I, I can't do it. It's going to take too much time. I've got too many commitments. I don't have enough money. So all of a sudden the insecurities rise. What happens is when these insecurities rise, the best hope for us is to take the focus off of ourselves and put it back on Jesus. Remember what the Bible says, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And if God is the one who calls us to a vision, here's the cool thing. He is the one that's going to equip us, empower us to make it happen. But when we look at ourselves, man, we'll fail every single day. Every single day. Nehemiah doesn't let this happen. I want to show you what happens. After I looked things over, I stood up, right? That's figurative. He's stepping up out of his despair, out of his uh, discouragement, out of his, um, um, his fears. He's standing up out of them. Imagine that happening. And he said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of your insecurities. Don't be afraid of your failures. Don't be afraid of your lack of resources. Don't be afraid that you're not as good of a communicator as somebody else is. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord. Remember, keep our eyes fixed on him. Don't remember our inadequacies. Don't remember our fears. Remember the God who called you in the first place. He is the one who is great and awesome and he fights for your brothers, your sisters and your brothers, your wives and your homes. This, here's, here's what I need us to understand. I'm telling myself this too, all right? Here's what we need to remember. If we compromise on fear, if we compromise on our insecurities, um, if we compromise on what we lack, man, we lose our vision. But watch this, if we remember our God, then we win. This, this is why I love it. Every time we at Brookside take communion together as a church family, what do we say? We say, we repeat what Jesus told his disciples. He says, every time you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, do it, what? In remembrance of me. Remember me. Why? Because when we on a regular basis, remember what Jesus has done for us, all of a sudden, our inadequacies, our insecurities, the own pushback that we give ourselves, all of a sudden that just fades away. It fades away. Here, here's something else too, guys. The greater the pushback against you, the greater the opportunity for God to fight for you. So here's the thing. Re remember your God and watch him fight for your family. Remember your God and watch him fight for your marriage. Remember your God and watch him fight for your, for your goal to get out of debt. Remember your God and watch him fight for you to graduate with a degree so you can have the skills to pursue the vision. Remember your God and watch him fight for his church in the midst of a medical crisis. Remember your God and watch him fight for the soul of the neighbor down the street who doesn't know him. Remember your God and the vision that he has called you to build will blossom. Guys, here's what I want to do. I want to pray with us right now. And uh, uh, before I pray with you, I, I want you guys to know that, that Jesus has already fought for us. Now, whether you agree with it, believe it, know it or not, on the cross, Jesus fought the greatest battle that has ever needed to be fought. He fought for our souls. He fought for our hearts. He fought for our minds. He fought for our salvation and eternity. And what he did, man, he won hands down. I mean, no contest. Satan didn't have a chance. Uh, the, the grave could not hold him. Uh, death couldn't touch him. Sin was vanquished all because of what Jesus did on the cross. And when we remember Jesus, the very first thing we remember is the battle he fought for us on the cross and how he won with no contest. And I recognize some of you watching this right now, 
maybe it's been hard for you to believe that in the past. Maybe it's been hard for you to understand why God would do that in the first place. I mean, is a God even existing out there? I don't know. But here, here's what I want you to know from myself and everybody else who calls Brookside their home. Man, we don't just believe this. Man, we live by it. Our entire world is centered on what Jesus has already done for us. Uh, and our hope, our hope is built solely on him. And if, if any of our lives is in any way appealing to you, because here's the thing, in a crisis like this, you've got people who will freak out, who will just lose everything. And then you have people who can move through this cautiously, but very confidently. And that's meant to be the church. Why? Because we serve a God who has already fought for us. And if he can defeat the grave, if he can defeat death, if he can defeat sin for us, man, he, he can get us through this. And so listen, if, if you've never embraced Jesus as your Lord and Savior, man, now's the time to do it. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pray with you. And then if you are at a watch party with another Brookside family, uh, as soon as this message is over, I want you to ask them what I'm talking about. And I want you to ask them this question, why have you said yes to Jesus? And how has that decision changed your life ever since? But for those who say, yeah, I know right now I'm ready. I wanna give my life to Jesus right now. Uh, I'm gonna say a prayer and I'm gonna encourage you wherever you're at right now, wherever you're watching, maybe you're in your pajamas, maybe you're still in bed, that's fine. Just pray this prayer with me. It goes like this, dear Jesus. I'm so grateful for what you did on the cross. I'm so grateful uh, that you were uncompromising in the vision God gave you to save our souls. I'm so grateful that you loved me enough to do that. I'm so grateful that what you did on the cross was strong enough to defeat sin, to defeat the grave and defeat death. And I'm so grateful that because of you, I have eternal life in heaven forever. I will see you face to face someday. And I will get to say thank you face to face. And so Jesus, I embrace the gift of salvation that you afforded me on the cross. I embrace this gift and I now call you mine because I believe you have already called me yours. For the rest of the church, for the rest of you watching, this is a great time to remember what Jesus did. And maybe it's a great time to just say thank you again because Jesus was uncompromising in the vision God gave him to save us. And we are benefits, uh, benefactors of what he did. Let's just say thank you to him real quick. Thank you, Jesus, for reminding me of what you did. Thank you for reminding me to keep my eyes on you and not on my insecurities and not on my fears, not on my doubts, not on anything else the world around us would tell me, uh, but keeping my eyes on you. And I commit to pushing forward towards the vision you have given me in an uncompromising kind of way so that I can accomplish for you what you've called me to accomplish. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Church, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever, that's me and you, believe in him will not die eternally, spiritually, but have everlasting life. That's a promise and that's for you and that's for me and it's ready for you to embrace right now. Thank you guys so much for being with us. We really do love you. Uh, we cannot wait to see you again, but until then, keep jumping in with us at Church Online. We're gonna be back here again next Sunday morning at nine o'clock a.m. And by the way, I hope you've spent some time uh, chatting with the staff in real time on Church Online. Um, and we would love to keep that relationship going with you. And until the time we can be back in person with you, we want you to know that we love you. We have not forgotten about you and we hope and pray you've not forgotten about us. Make sure you also tune in during the week as we give you any kind of updates related to the coronavirus. Also, we're gonna put out daily devotionals from the staff. So keep your eyes open for that. We love you guys so much. Have a great day and we'll see you later. Hey guys, you made it once again to the end of the video. And we're so glad that again, you have stayed with us this entire time. 
my prayer is that this message has been encouraging to you and an inspiration. Maybe it's a resolution that you needed to say, I'm going to get back on track with what God has called me to do. And so let us know that you are with us. Let us know you made it through the whole service. And on the feed, on your Facebook page, simply write this quote, pray, pause to pray, and then get back to work. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks so much for being with us. See you later.